Hello everyone, welcome to my brief lesson on number representations in math methodology. I recommend for those watching this video that if you are uncomfortable or this is new to you, revisit this topic. Practice, of course. And be prepared to have some fun. Okay, so let's get to it. The emphasis of this component in this video will be to review various ways of representing numbers and how to translate between them, as well as to recognize common stumbling blocks for students as an educator. As a refresh, consider that numeracy's big idea, the big idea emphasized by the Ministry of Education, is that the value of numbers is represented in everyday life, which is what we call numeracy. We communicate a lot of meaning through numbers, and look at some of the examples and applications. Percentages, money, reading a digital clock, fractions, temperature, cooking, light, time. But they've even done studies, and if you had a bunch of numbers rattle off across the screen, you would be able to tell which pile of numbers is fast is larger or smaller than another pile of numbers. Similarly, if you were to give an object of similar or close size, that's a little too close in size, let's try that again. If we tried something that was even similar in size, what we would notice is that we can tell which one has more. And so numeracy is focused a lot on quantizing or calculating what that is. Specifically today, I'm going to talk about proportional reasoning. And there are some key assumptions that need to be considered when you're thinking about proportional reasoning. The first is that items can be scaled according to their contribution. So if I have something that is two-thirds red and one-third blue, then its contribution, even if I make it larger, will still be two-thirds red and one-third blue. So this idea of scale or multiplying by the same amount is also true if I go smaller, if I represent something in a smaller way but the amount of each contribution should be even. And so this implies that there is equal multiplication on both sides. That if I multiply this by, say, 2, then this would also be times 2. If I, if I divided this, say, by 3, then I'm going to divide this by 3 also. Their contributions to maintain the same must be done equally. We call this similar contributions. And we consider these equivalent. These pictures here are equivalent. So common difficulties here is that the final answer doesn't look the same. So let's take a quick example. If we had two-thirds, that's the same as fourth-sixths, which is the same as, uh, let's see, I'm going to stretch my brain here, 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.3 repeated. And we could also go larger. We could say 12 over, uh, let's see, times 3, 18. There we go. So the difficulty is that these answers don't actually look the same. The other difficulty is that there are different rules for maintaining and representing each way of representing a number. Lastly, of course, converting between representations requires mastery. I'm going to do a brief coverage of all of these in the next couple minutes. As you observe this, I'm going to go from left to right across, and I'm going to move from top down as I move through the column. So let's start with decimals. One decimal, six, seven, four. Decimals are really great for representing exact, and I use that in quotation values because it's when possible. And it's easier to perceive than fractions, so often they get used for that reason. Now, unfortunately... It's not always precise, and I use the example here of one-third equals zero decimal three, three, three repeated. In fact, we can never put enough threes to represent one-third, and that's the difficulty with decimal values. It works where each place has a value. So you see here one times one. We see six of zero decimal ones, seven of zero decimal zero one, and four of zero decimal zero zero one, or one one-thousandth. Some common difficulties students have is they don't recognize that each place has a different value. Like a 2 is a 2, and, and it doesn't matter where it is. So if we see the number 2 
decimal three, seven, two. A student may not recognize that this first two is two ones and the second two is two one thousandths. So their value is actually quite a bit different, even though the number that we're looking at looks the same. Instructional strategies will be covered on the following slides. So let's take a look at ratios. Here we see four apples to seven oranges. It's useful for looking at relationships between any two items, but it cannot be used very well in mathematical equations. Like when we see four to seven, it's very difficult to work with that, but it does create some excellent visualizations. It can be reversed. So we see seven oranges to four apples, but we also could see seven oranges to, f to 11 fruit. Right? Which I would represent with a little O, perhaps. Rates are represented such as, you know, 10 kilometers per hour. It's a very common, familiar one, a speed. But they don't just have to be speeds. They can be a relationship between any two numbers. Ratios can be written as fractions. So we could take our four sevens up here, and we could write that as four over seven, remembering that the four represents oranges, and that the seven represents... Oops, I got that backwards. Four represents apples, seven represents oranges. As you can see, it's important to keep track of these things because if you mislabel it, you can actually end up with the wrong reasoning. An, an important distinction here is that it can only represent numbers as a division, which means it cannot represent things like pi or irrational numbers. The bottom number cannot be zero. That's another limitation for this particular one. Also, a common misconception is forgetting that this line actually represents division. Students begin to treat the top and bottom numbers separately rather than recognizing their relationship, that of division. This is one of the common difficulties. I would always recommend to go over plus, minus, times, and divide when covering this topic with students. So show them addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. With respect to percents, we see 167.4%, but when students see this, they don't recognize that these decimal numbers are equivalent. What's more is that this decimal has a different meaning than this decimal on the left. This kind of confusion where the symbol looks the same, but its meaning is different, is one of the main reasons students, I think, get confused. But one of the ways that I teach it is to focus on the fact that percent means out of 100. That's its literal meaning. When decimals were invented, if you will, they didn't have to be worth 10 for each value. So as we look at a number, this number counts to 10, and then it goes to the next digit. Then the next number counts to 10, and it goes to the next digit, and so on. Well, way back when in Babylonian times, they used to use 60. So they would have a number, say, that would go from 1 all the way to 60. And as soon as it reached 60, you would then hit their equivalent of 10. So their 10 might be 160 and zero ones, as an example. So let's look at this in a little more detail. We, of course, know this one is the hundreds, the tens, the ones. This always confuses students because they might think that there's a once column, but that wouldn't make much sense. One over one is just one. This is tenths hundredths, and of course thousandths. And their place value is very unique. This one is 10 to the power of 2, 10 to the power of 1, 10 to the power of 0, 10 to the power of negative 1, 10 to the power of negative 2, and 10 to the power of negative 3. And we could represent this as 300 plus 1 plus 0 decimal 6 plus 0 decimal 0, 7 plus 0 decimal 0, 0, 4. And that gives us our total of 301 decimal 6, 7, 4. This kind of revision, while I've gone through it very quickly, each element of this would be its own lesson on it and is often needed for students to understand the material. So now let's look at ratios. In here, I use the phrase, it takes at least two to tango. It's not a ratio if you're not comparing two things. So here we see four apples which I'll represent with the letter A, to seven oranges. But there are other ways to represent this. We could, for example, say seven oranges and four apples. 
But there's a whole other way. We could say four apples to 11 fruit. We could also say seven oranges to 11 fruit. And we could reverse those as well. For every 11 fruit, there will be seven oranges. So these read left to right. But they are also reversible. So we can reverse a ratio. A lot of the other ways in which we represent numbers, they are not reversible. But in ratios, they are. You can think of them as mirrors of a sort. Students often forget the order in which they are looking at things. And they also tend to overlook the entire ratio. You'll see this in an example that follows. So here I'm going to represent a little bit about fractions. Ideally, I would take more time to cover this material, but it is my assumption that you have some prior knowledge as you watch this, and if need be, you can always rewatch it again. So let's look at addition. If we have a third plus a half, visibly, that becomes obvious that we can't add these two symbols together. They are different in size. So what we do in math is we recognize that if I cut the pie into equal parts, in this case, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, then I can commence the addition. So one third times two times two plus one half times two times two, that gives me two plus, oops, made a little mistake there. In order to get to six, I had to divide the halves by three. So two plus three over six, or five sixths. The same idea happens if we're looking at subtraction. If we look at a half and we subtract a third, we would see mathematically that we create what's called the lowest common denominator. An easy trick is to just look at the other two numbers and exchange their places. So when we do this, we get 3 sixths minus 2 sixths. A lot of students don't recognize that this bottom number is important, but the bottom number indicates size of the piece. And so they think often, er erroneously, that they can just subtract numbers as they will. Lastly, I'm going to look at multiplication and division. So suppose I take the number two-thirds and I want to multiply that by three. Well, as you'll see in next week's class, there's a lot of invisible work going on in math. So if I multiply this by three, two times three, well, that makes six. And we keep top to top and bottom to bottom. So this gives us an answer of... Six-thirds or two. Division is a little bit different. If we were to divide by two, again, we're dividing the top by two and we're dividing the bottom by one in this case. But the easier way to think about it is to turn it into multiplication by flipping the fraction. Two-thirds divided by two is the same as two-thirds times one-half. Then we can go back to our regular old rules. Top to top, bottom to bottom. So this gives us two over six, which we can reduce to one-third. Again, reviewing these rules is very important. And you can imagine that this is very non-intuitive for students to look at. When they're working with fractions, it's one of the most difficult challenges because the rules are different. This whole idea that the bottom, that the size of that bottom matters before we can do traditional addition and subtraction. In fact, in comparison, addition and multi or, sorry, multiplication and division are quite a bit easier. Let's look at decimals and percents. In particular, percent means divide by 100. So if we just take a decimal, say 1 decimal 74, and we want to turn that into a percent, we take the decimal and we slide it over two spots, giving us 174%. Where students tend to get this wrong is if they see a decimal like 0 decimal 03. They don't necessarily recognize that this decimal moves over two spots to the right. Two to the right. That's usually how I remember it. And so you end up with 3%. But let's look at going from percent to decimal. Again, this time you're going to take the decimal and you're going to move it 2 to the left. So if we had 167.4%, 
and we take that decimal and we slide it over two spots to the left, which, by the way, is the same as 167.4 out of 100. If you did that on your calculator, you would see that you get 1.674. The trick of moving the decimal two spots to the left, in fact, only works because of the value of the decimal itself. If we were working with a different number system, like in binary or hexadecimal, this wouldn't work. So this leaves us with 1.674. Now these numbers, 167.4 and 1.674, are equivalent only if we add this percent sign. Some of the difficulties that students have when they do this is they'll say, I've got 47%, and they'll represent it as a decimal, 0.47, and they'll say that's the same as 47%. And without writing that percent sign, it actually can lead them to quite a bit of confusion in knowing that these two are the same idea. So now let's look at converting between forms and how we could use them to solve an equation. This is a typical ratio style equation or word problem. So to begin with, we have four nuts for seven bolts. So there we are, four nuts for every seven bolts. And since I've got nuts and bolts, I'm going to look at the total. So the total is 4 plus 7, or in this case, 11. So that means for every 4 nuts, there will be 11 pieces, which I'll represent with an 11, P. I also know that for every 7 bolts, there will be 11 pieces. So in this question, I see that there are 275 nuts and bolts, and that's the real key to this question. There are nuts and bolts present. So that means we're looking at a total. So 275 total parts, or pieces, I want to look at how many nuts there are, which I will represent with the letter N. And that's going to be equal to 11 pieces for every four nuts. Now you might wonder, how did I know to choose that one? I was choosing it based on the names, nuts and pieces. And I was also choosing it so that the P's lined up at the top and the N's lined up at the bottom. I now have created an equals representation, an equation for the overall system. This equation is possible because we know by proportional reasoning that if the nut ratio of four nuts for every seven bolts is true, then that will also be true even in a makeup of 275 nuts, or and bolts combined. So I know that there's going to be some sort of multiplying number here that is going to be the same for both. So I'm going to remove all of the letters now. I'm going to keep just the variable I don't know, and I'm going to solve. So we see 275 over n equals 11 over 4. There are many techniques you could use here. The one that I teach most commonly is cross multiplication. So 11n is equal to 4 times 275. 11n will equal 1100. 11n equals 1100. We divide both sides by 11, and we see that we have 100 nuts. So if there are 275 nuts there would, and bolts, there would be 100 nuts, and there would be, I can do the math really quickly, the bolts would be 175 bolts. I could quickly check my work, which I'm going to do down here. I've run out of space. So if I go 175 divided by 100, and I reduce that fraction, what do I get? If you divide top and bottom by 25, you get 7 fourths, giving us bolts to nuts, giving us what we were looking for. So that concludes the overall lesson that I was focusing on for today. Again, there was a lot of material covered here, showing you many different ways of representing the various rates, ratios, percents, and fractions. If you're struggling with any of these ideas, please send me an email for additional resources and I can provide you with some additional practice. With a partner or in a group, if you're watching this in a group, I'd like you to discuss the following. Which of the representations, decimals, fractions, ratios, and percents do you personally struggle with most? And select one of the representations and brainstorm ways in which you can overcome the difficulties in teaching this idea to your students.